welcome to this Black History Month event as part of the South Phantom Arts and Humanities Festival. My name is Estrella Sandra and I will be your host this evening. I've been working for Winchester School of Art for the last three years in the MA Global Media Management and we have curated a series of events entitled Activism and Resilience. Welcome to the very first of them, which is Senegalese Music to Raise Coronavirus Awareness. I would like first to thank you very thank you very much for joining us to this very needed celebration and also thank you so much for the organizers for putting it together and a special thanks to Dr. Silvia Lanati for the operations who is the operations lead for all the organization of this event. I'm delighted to introduce you to our guest this evening which is Katie, a Senegalese rapper, artist, activist, and journalist. Katie is an emblematic figure in Senegal whose work and influence has traveled beyond geographical boundaries. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to him today. Katie, welcome. Hi, Celia. Thank you. Other than his music, which started with his first group album so many years ago already in 1998, Katie has been very involved with the society through educational programs. And he's also the co-founder of a really interesting initiative that I absolutely love, which is Journal Rappé, which is the first television news broadcasting program, Wrapped, which he co-founded with Kuman, another Senegalese rapper, back in 2013. Today we are going to be actually talking to you about a really interesting project that we got to work together on the coronavirus pandemic. And it's sort of a preview because we will be publishing it very soon in the next issue of the Journal of African Media Studies in the special issue Media and the Corona Pandemic in Africa. We will be talking about Senegalese songs that were composed to raise awareness about coronavirus, but since our notion of time has become rather blurry in times of pandemic, I thought that it would be really nice to start with a chronological overview. So I'm just going to share a few slides that we have prepared for you for today and um, so that we can get a bit of a context of how everything started. Here we have some images of some of the songs that were composed in times of pandemic. And as I said, I put over there as well the information about the forthcoming article. So if you are interested, please have a look as we finish talking today and pay attention to the next journal's issue. Right, let's have a look at this chronological timeline. We start with the 19th of March, 2020, and this was when the song Pagaruchi Coronavirus started. A really interesting song composed by Jean Emar, and Katie will talk plenty about this later. But I wanted to mention this because this is really early. On the 23rd of March is actually when the lockdown happened, not only in the UK, but also in Senegal. And this is also where we have another song called Nafi Yogi. Three days, late, three days later, we have the special edition of the Journal Rappé, that TV news broadcasting program that I was just mentioning. And the following day, the Senegalese president, Macky Sall, decided to meet with several musicians who had been involved in composing songs, who had been involved, been involved in previous social issues. And out of this meeting, there was another song that came out on the 13th of April 2020, which was Dan Corona. Right. On the 27th of March, there were no death cases and there were only 117 infection cases in Senegal. The situation will change later and we will cover that in our talk today when we talk about the difference between the first and the second wave of the pandemic in Senegal. By the 26th of July, there were around 26 songs raising coronavirus awareness. So this is something really interesting for us to think about. And this is one of the very first things that I wanted you to talk to us about, Katie, how to explain this bars of creativity because no matter how much we admire this original response and sense of social responsibility, this was not an exception, right? Katie, would you like to tell us a bit about the important role that artists plays in the Senegalese society? And I want to enjoy this moment as well to please invite everyone to put all the time any questions you may have as well to Katie here in the chat for us. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Australia. Um, that was a nice review of 
um, how things happened here um, because um, it's very important to, so that we can put everything in context. Um, now, to answer your question, uh, indeed, it is nothing particular to see artists, Senegalese artists, um, being involved into uh, Senegalese society, um, addressing social or political issues and various other, other issues. Um, because um, traditionally, the Senegalese artists, um, which is called artists nowadays, but back in the days it was the griot, we'll come back to, to, that, to that term. Um, the Senegalese artists historically isn't, um, contrarily to the European conception of the artist, isn't someone who is sort of dwelling in his own universe and who communicates with society from his own universe, um, sort of um, backstepping from society so that they can have a better look. Senegalese artists, in particular, African artists in, in general, didn't have that role and still don't have that role. Um, um, because um, art artists were perceived as something that had to be useful to society. So in that sense, and I, I still remember when I was a kid um, growing up where we had only one TV channel for the whole country, we had one radio for the whole country. <coughs> When there were events, um, for example, a child missing, um, mm -hmm. of course, there would be announcers on the radio, but not all Senegalese people could afford it. But one thing all Senegalese people could afford was to pay an artist, a griot, to go around town with his drum and drum and give the name of the kid where uh, he was or oh, she was last time seen how the child was dressed you know in 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 cases of 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 death funerals um birth we also had that musicians going around um and giving the news to the people so that role of the artist informing the people is deeply rooted into senegalese society um so therefore um Seeing Senegalese artists committed to social issues is nothing particular, as we as we say. Um, and in recent times, um, regarding health issues, we've had um, the rollback malaria campaign with Liu Sundu in the 2010s, um, with other uh, prominent African artists like Angelique Kijo, like Chicken Jafakoli, like Said Keita, and they've been touring West Africa. Um, and giving um, giving nets to people to protect them against mosquitoes, make them aware of how they can they can protect themselves. Um, we've also had in 2014 when Ebola cases um, broke in West Africa, um, a sub-regional effort between uh, several artists. Um, to address the, the, the Ebola crisis, also make a song, tell people how they can protect themselves, how they can pr protect their family. Locally, we've, we've had, for example, uh, Fumalad from Yanama, who's a rapper, who produced a song with another rapper, Pakuti, and it was very successful um, because there was a sort of, um, in the method, that they're making the songs, it's so simple and so easy to catch that the message remains. So that song with Pakuti was also um, was also to raise awareness uh, about malaria, and it was very successful. So it's 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 nothing new seeing Senegalese artists making songs uh, about the coronavirus. That's a really useful context to then now be able to watch a bit of these songs, right? Because we were talking about around 26 songs that were composed in times of pandemic to raise awareness of this. But I'm sure that many of the people who are present here today have not seen them. And we would really like actually 
to hear your thoughts, actually read them in the chat when we play this. Let's now listen to this. Let's play this extract of a few songs that we put together and that we studied for our project, which are Pagaruchi Coronavirus, Nafi Joge, and Dan Corona, as well as the special edition of Journal Rappé on the coronavirus pandemic. Let's have a look. So I remember coming across these videos on social media quite a lot, as I said, around March and April and being fascinated by the creativity. Back in the days, there were also some coverage as well about graffitis being on the streets and so on. And there are so many musicians that were involved. Katie, I reach out to you, remember, and ask you, let's do something about this together. Yeah, and you yeah. got to talk to some of the people who made these videos. What, what did they tell you and what motivated them to make these videos? Look, um, it's, it's, it's nothing complicated. Um, and actually, um, the, I've, I've, I've interviewed several artists who are uh, present in the different videos we've watched. I've interviewed Fumalad of Yanama, Kuman, who made the Journal Rappé, uh, and Deep, who is part of the Dan Corona. And they're quite representative of the different generations of Senegalese hip hop. Fuman from the old school, Fumalad Intermediate, and Deep, who's very recent and who's the biggest artist right now in Senegal. But um, all of them had a particular reason um, to engage in, in, in that fight against the coronavirus uh, through music and on social media. For Homan, it was mainly about um, fighting misinformation um, because when the pandemic started, uh, there were a lot of rumors mm -hmm. um, and for him, his contribution was to tackle that misinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, for Fumalad, he's got a particular understanding of his role as an artist. And as I, as I talked about um, in the beginning, for Fumalad, he cannot be an artist and not be useful to his society. And that was the reason why when um, the pandemic started, he took upon himself to have all of these programs in the suburbs of Dakar, which is a quite different place from the where, from the one uh, me, Human, or Deep are living. Um, and for someone like Deep, uh, it was more of a because he he is getting bigger and bigger as an artist since uh, uh, four or five years, and for him that was a way to give back to the people because. He considered that the people had supported him when he needed it. And this was the time for him to be there for the people. So very, very simple reasons when you when you really look at it. And there are around 26 songs and they are very different, yet they share a series of features, right? Remember when we were analyzing them and so on, what are some of the features that you would highlight from uh, these songs? And I also enjoy this chance to please ask people to uh, include thoughts and comments in the chat so that I can also ask these questions to Katie and share their thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, um, look, um, okay, first let's not focus on the, on the artistic content, but mm -hmm. the context and the way those songs were released. Uh, what most of those songs had, and especially the, the, the songs we worked on, the, the songs that we chose, which are the Journal Rappé, Fagoruchi Corona, Virus, Nafi Joge, and Dan Corona, those songs, actually, they were released at the very beginning of the pandemic. There was no governmental request to make those songs. There was no organization behind um, asking artists to do those songs. Artists did them by their own. And yeah, of course, when you look at the 23 songs we worked on, later there would be some songs that were made because the ministry of health wanted to have a song but the majority of those 23 songs just followed the same trail as the, the, the which is we do it because it's our country it's our people and we have to give the information to the people so they can protect themselves so that's one one particularity they, they, they all have. Um, 
The other thing is, and it is very, very important, there were very few songs released with only one artist in it. So almost all of the songs, I think from what I know, um, there are only two songs that are done by solo artists, but all of the rest are collaborations. And when I, when I interviewed um, Deep, for example, the way he understood it is, because he is one artist who released this track by himself, but um, he felt um, the obligation to go join other artists, collaborate on that song, because um, we're in a poor country, um, our healthcare system is very fragile. So the only way um, we could um, face COVID, get through it, is when we get together. Mm -hmm. And by working with other artists, um, that is the message they wanted to send, that look, um, we got to join forces and do this thing together. We, it's time to put political differences aside religious differences aside, whatever differences aside, because we need to face this together. And that is what we're doing on this on this track, because it's hip hop, it's rap, artists, artists are having beefs, they clash. Um, but when such a crisis happens, we forget about our differences and we get together to do these songs and tell people how to um, how, how not to catch the virus but also how to react, how to behave if you, if you get the virus. So the, the, the collaborative aspect um, is one shared feature. Um, another, another aspect is um, the fact that most of the songs are multilingual mm. because we are in an area, uh, we are in a country where the official language is French, but almost 50% of Senegalese people don't understand and speak French. So it's the responsibility of the government, it's the responsibility of the artist to spread the message in different languages. Mm -hmm. So that multilingual aspect of the song is very present um, amongst most of the most of the 23 songs we've, uh, we've worked on. Um, and, and, the other thing. Let's talk. Sorry, sorry. Peter, but let's talk a bit more about that because I put some titles actually on the songs uh, that uh, had some sections in Wolof, which is the main uh, lingua franca in Senegal mm -hmm. and in French because I speak those. But they were also in difficult in different kinds of languages, right? In Mandinka, yeah, we had Mandinka, we had Pula, mm -hmm. you know, um, we had Sere. Um, Literally, um, the, 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 the most common languages um, in, in, in Senegal. And, and those things are important because, uh, because of different ethnicities, uh, we, we always get to be aware not to frustrate communities, um, to send a message that um, you are visible mm -hmm. um, because we're transmitting the message in your language for the people um, of this community who don't speak any other language than this one. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it's very interesting. It was very interesting to see actually, because from my own experience, I know um, that um, whenever we're working on songs like that, I've, I've, I've participated into songs like that at one point, People are just like, yeah, but there's too much, too much Wolof. We need other languages. So it's a real concern that the message is spread in different languages um, because um, we want the song to be efficient. We want the song to be inclusive. Um, mm -hmm. So not only languages, but genders also. Um, all of those things are taken into account to be a representation of the Senegalese society. Mm -hmm. There was another feature that we highlighted other than it being multilingual, collaborative, and uh, sort of relating as well to that history of social com commitment from the musicians that you were talking about. 
there was also that idea of the clarity of information, right? The ability yes. to translate a specialist language. So can you talk to us a little bit more about that and, and how those messages were changing as well throughout time? Yeah, you, you, know, you know, when I was interviewing Fumala at one point, he insisted on is um, was the importance for artists to uh, spread this message because over the years there's, there, there's been a sort of distrust between Senegalese people and the Senegalese government. Mm -hmm. um, and um, artists being socially committed for social justice, uh, for democracy, for transparency, for accountability, um, very often have clashes with the government. Mm -hmm. So once the people see those same artists who are who've been fighting politicians, fighting the government over over these last years. Once the people see those artists get into the campaign to raise awareness against the coronavirus, the message is taken more seriously. That distrust that was initially there um, is being dealt with. Um, and the other thing is. Again, the official language of the Senegalese government is French. The Senegalese government communicates in French. Um, therefore, um, the message might not get to some people. Um, and that is, one, that is one particularity in all of the songs that all of the communication of the government regarding the coronavirus, the Ministry of Health, the pamphlets they, they released, um, the indication they, they gave for people to protect themselves, the numbers uh, they gave for people to call in case of infection, it was all done in French. So in all of the songs, artists made sure to translate those messages into very simple sentences for the people to understand, to know where to go, who to call in case of an infection. So that clarity in the message is present in most of the songs, in all of the songs, should I, I, I should say. And not only the clarity, but for artists even who, um, who didn't um, collaborate, for songs that didn't collaborate, um, one song recorded, um, in the north of Senegal, another song recorded in the capital city of Senegal, we realized during our study that there were key words or key sentences that were repeated on all of the songs. Because um, here we say uh, 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 repet repetition is pedagogy. Um, and I think artists, Senegalese artists have integrated that very well to repeat the message again and again. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, some songs are called Fagaru, other, other songs are called Dan, other songs are called Kher, but in all of the songs, you will hear Fagaru Morgan Fagaru. Yeah. It's better to prevent than to try and heal. So that, um, that repetitive aspect, and which is, which is very related to the oral tradition of exactly. Senegal, um, that, 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 that repetition also is one big shared aspect of, of, of these songs. Another, another aspect is how the timeline of the songs followed the timeline of the Ministry of Health. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. Because first, the first songs talked about prevention. But the last songs talked about not stigmatizing those with COVID because, because of the communication. Um, and yeah, I must say with, with international TV, with local TVs, since people didn't know about COVID, so it was mainly certain on fear. The communication was certain on fear. Then when the first cases started to happen, People were ashamed to say to be to be to be diagnosed with uh, with the virus. People were hiding. Some people were fleeing, running around the country because they didn't want to. They didn't want to go uh, into quarantine, you know. And all of that created a very tense um, 
environment. So then the, the last songs they, that came out during the first waves were more about stigmatization. This is just a virus. There's no shame um, uh, having, having, having the, the, the virus. Just go to the hospital and let doctors take care of you. If not, you're exposing other people. So um, those, are, those are mainly the, 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 the features, um, the specifics that we can find here in there in the songs uh, among this group of trying three songs we worked on. Mm -hmm. Fascinating responses and I have plenty of questions, but there are also questions and comments already coming from the audience. So I would like to start addressing them to you. Thank you very much for your engagement and please feel free to continue putting them. We are talking to Katie, a Senegalese rapper involved in the songs that were composed in Senegal to raise awareness about coronavirus and who I have the pleasure to work with in a co-authored journal article that is going to be very soon published in the Journal of African Media Studies. We have a question from my colleague, uh, Dr. Megan de Vroom-Mollet. Thank you for joining us today. And she's asking about platforms, Katie. She's asking yeah. about something we also talked about in our article, which is social media and so on. But let me read the question to you. In terms mm -hmm. of platforms that you use to share these songs, are you able to collect data or feedback from the audience and use that as well to inform future performances of the potential impact of social media and dissemination of these messages? Um, look, um, I think the whole world of, of social media, internet, is pretty... Um, pretty no here. Um, and when I say pretty no, it's not that it wasn't here in 2010, it was here in 2010, but very few people, very few artists were aware of all those tools of uh, uh, statistics, having numbers, percentages, um, and um, it took, for example, when we started doing Journal Rappé for even us to be aware of those things because we needed to have those numbers to know how to redirect the subjects we were talking about in Journal Rappé. The land, uh, should we make it shorter, should we make it longer? Um, and it's very recently, very recently, that, for example, the job of a community manager has become important here. And um, of course, artists are not going to go on Instagram or on YouTube looking at the statistics, um, looking at the analytics. That's the job of a, of, a, of a community manager. Some of them, artists like Deep, Deep for example, he's got a good team with a community manager, and they take, take care about those things. Um, and that that is that is that is really a good question because that's that's actually one of the last points we were supposed to develop in this talk. The impact. How can we measure the impact of mm -hmm. such of such a campaign? We'll address it later. But um, um, as a as a as an answer, a direct answer to that question, um, measuring the impact for the moment is not really important for Senegalese artists. We've, and when I say measuring the impact, I mean with analytics. The only way to measure the impact is, um, the, or the most frequent way to measure the impact is to go on YouTube and see how many views the video got, which is a direct, you know, direct impact, but there are things happening in the back and we are more interested by what's happening in the back to know with Journal Rappé, for example, we could know um, from where people were watching Journal Rappé, we could know the age rate, we could know um, gender, and all of those information were really important to us. And I just hope that for future campaigns, Senegalese artists will also take care of getting the analytics of the, the, the songs, the videos, so that they can have a better idea of who the audience is and how to impact them much better. 
And you were saying that social media is kind of new and I mean, it existed since 2010 or even before and so on. Yeah. But at the same time, isn't it true that small media devices are even larger than the Senegalese population? And this is something yeah. that is something to take into account as a means because social media, could we say that it's sort of replacing radio or complementing the important role of Of course, of, of course. Just like, just like uh, anywhere else in the world, internet has taken over um, and artists are having a bigger impact because they're in control of their communication. they in direct contact with their audience. Um, and uh, literally, they're the only one to curate their content. Mm. Um, if, if there's censor censorship, it is censorship, censorship they, they decide of, not an institution being there, but it's really them feeling comfortable or not with what they're sharing. So in that sense, um, Senegalese artists are using more and more the internet. What happened um, now is nowadays, artists release their videos even without sending it to the TVs. Mm. That was 10 years ago, that was something you couldn't imagine. Now, artists don't care. They just release their video on the internet, have their millions of views, and for the TVs to get the version of the video, they go on the internet and download the, 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 the HD video. But artists are not, are not making the efforts anymore mm -hmm. to collaborate with TV, looking for interviews. There are many in, uh, online shows, and those online shows are favored because it simply takes one click from the audience to listen to their artists, to, to watch their interview. So um, now people are much more investing into having a community manager, um, having a good camera that, uh, that can film very quickly when they're in the studio and upload on the internet, on Instagram, on Facebook, Twitter. Um, so yeah, and, and as you were saying, Senegal is a small country, right? 17 million people, 18 million mobile devices. Indeed. So, and it's growing bigger and bigger every year. Mm -hmm. Megan is saying, thank you, fantastic work and really interesting. And actually there was something that you said that connects with the second question that she had, which was around fans response, because obviously these are influencers. These musicians have so yeah. many followers. And there's a yeah. question up here that says, have any of these fans uh, of these musicians engaged with their messages by, for example, recording songs themselves, posting messages themselves, or responded in their own words to what these musicians were spreading for music? Yeah, of course. Of course. Actually, um, um, the, 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 the notion of this is the neighborhood I'm coming from is very strong in Senegalese hip hop. Um, just like Americans, American rappers are saying when they say that they put their cities on the map because there is a map of hip hop, there is also a map of hip hop in Dakar, in Senegal. Certain neighborhoods, when you think about hip hop, you don't think about those neighborhoods because there's no prominent rappers come, rapper coming from those areas. So um, now what happens, because each rapper is trying to, um, to develop a fan base, um, the fan, there is a sort of like concurrence between fan bases. Um, we've seen, for example, an artist like Deep, not only did he participate in Tudan Corona, not only did he make his own song to raise awareness against the coronavirus. One of my but, favorite ones I was telling you. Yeah, before. it's, it's a beautiful it. one. It's a beautiful one. And not only did he, did he record those songs, but he went on the ground um, with food for his whole neighborhood. Um, um, he, 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 gave, he gave groceries. And the people were really surprised. And his fans were really proud of that. 
and seeing the artists on the ground engage into the fight against the coronavirus also brings them out because um, a movement like Yanama, um, and it's it's um, uh, it's a pity um, that I didn't put um, that photo in the slide. They can be seen going out in the street with other supporters of Yanama, whether they are supporters of the movement or supporters of the artists who are in the movement. People going out in the streets, not only in Dakar, even outside in 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 the in, in inside of Senegal and distributing masks to people because in the in the beginning of the pandemic there was a shortage of masks here so the government had a mask mandate but we couldn't find masks anywhere and people started getting arrested because they was in they were in cars they were out in the street without a mask and then Yanamar made started making its own mask and going out and distributing it to people. But Yanamar is just a small, uh, a small group of artists. So they rely mainly on the people supporting the artists, supporting the movement to when they're having campaigns like that. Yeah, it's the third photo here. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the third photo, they can be seen in the street distributing the mass. So yeah, it's having that effect on the fans. Um, and I think um, even some people who were who who had doubts about the efficiency of masks, um, how how it can help prevent um, the virus or stop the virus, or how staying home can save you from the virus. I think because they were fans of artists like Deep um, that make them change their position a bit you know because there there's this there's this peer pressure of um my artist thinks this all other people who like him as i do they think this so why should i um yeah but it 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 it, it doesn't mean that necessarily all of the fans agreed with them but the majority i think really agreed with them and it pushed them to to be proactive when it comes to the virus mm -hmm. so a way as well of becoming a reference and examples of small little actions can actually really help and then seeing that translated on the streets yeah yeah i mean someone like human for example when we when we did the interview because he had made this this, this song, um, mm -hmm. but also because he had made this Ronald Rappé, um, some young people from his neighborhood came to visit him mm. and they didn't have much means, but they were like, okay, we want to go to the neighborhood, um, knock on doors, talk to people and see how we can get organized so that we're not putting our neighborhood at risk. If we should have um, some points out in the street where people can wash their hands, if we can distribute masks and see even if it's possible for poor, for us to help poor families. So Homan did the song and young people from his neighborhood came to visit him. So because they know that he's very interested into, into those subjects. Um, so, yeah, that's why I tend to believe that it has an impact, um, to which extent that is the question that needs to be answered. Mm -hmm. We've seen Kuman actually in the images, for those of you who don't know him, he appeared in the song Napi Joge, singing to the microphone in a studio, and his voice was the one that we were hearing in the special edition of the Journal Rappé. That's the context in which we met, actually, Katie. Um, a few years ago yeah. now, I think it was 2011. Um, yeah, I think so, yeah. When I, it, no, it, it cannot be 2011. I think it was 2013 uh, when the journal was just started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we That's had an been, interview yeah. about the format and so on. Excellent. Well, right. there's also a comment here from Maimuna Jalo, uh, who says, mm -hmm. fantastic work and music. Hi, Maimuna, we will see your film on Friday. And for you, those of you who are here, 
please make sure you do come to the film screening as well of A Tales of the Accidental City uh, this Friday, 22nd at 5 p.m. Maimuna has also a question for us. Are there instances when songs are used for bad rather than good? Were there ways in which these songs were in use for good purposes? Um, for this campaign, we we didn't have we didn't have that because I think um, from the beginning um, everybody was aware of the seriousness of this situation. If it wasn't for the virus, even even if we're not talking about the virus, but just the consequences on people's lives, mm -hmm. because um, we had a curfew for um two months i think the first curfew and you imagine a curfew in a country where people the majority of people earn a salary day by day mm. they don't they're not waiting until the end of the month what they're gonna eat tomorrow they earn it today and there is a curfew um so it, it created a lot of uh, difficulties. People couldn't um, couldn't have access to food anymore. Some people in some areas um, in the north of Senegal, for example, it, it impact, impacted the herders mm -hmm. um, who would go uh, from one city to the other, and that's how they're making their money. But since there was this restriction on um, on people's mobility, you couldn't go from one city to the other anymore. People had, had to stay in one place. Um, and um, all of those things sort of uh, impacted um, the people. And at the end, um, and I, I don't know if, uh, if we can show the slide real quick. Yeah. Um, it, ended up, it ended up in riots. Mm. People were out in the street rioting because they couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So the situation was really serious. This was this was the the beginning of the pandemic. At the beginning of the pandemic, everybody's thinking, "Yeah, this is going to be over in three months. This is going to be over in six months." So everybody was really committed to uh, to respecting the measures, being creative, coming with creative solutions. Um, yeah, we don't got a big budget for our country, but we got our minds and we can come up with solutions. And actually these people had created a washing, uh, a washing machine, a mobile washing machine where people could uh, just wash their hand out, hands out in the street. But when the curfew um, came into effect, people started feeling the, um, the consequences of the curfew and there were also other stories where um, the elite of this country were meeting at night during the curfew, having parties, um, and all of those candles were put out um, on the news by journalists. People started to rebel and it ended and it, and it, and it in protests and, and riots. Um, so, and I think just because of the seriousness of this situation, um, something like that, using the song for, uh, for another purpose um, didn't happen. In other cases, for example, during presidential campaign, it happened a lot that politicians are using some songs, but for another objective, um, really, tr uh, really transforming the lyrics or uh, using it for, an, for for a purpose that is very different from the artist. But for the coronavirus, it didn't happen here. Mm -hmm. Actually, Maimona is saying to clarify, not in terms of the campaign, but for example, during political campaigns, for example, thinking of the broader oh, yeah. role of the musicians oh, yeah. as popular it messengers. It, 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 happened, it happened a lot. It mm. happened a lot. I, I, I participated in a campaign um, two or three years ago with Human um, against uh, domestic violence against women. And um, the motto was Doina. Doina means stop, it's yeah. enough. So, and it was the video, music, photos, and actually um, six months later, 
the opposition used that same video and re-edited the video to put the president's image in between artists saying, stop, it's enough. So that happens a lot in Senegal um, and, and elsewhere, I guess, because um, with the new media now, people feel that they can share whatever misinformation they want to share. Um, uh, and that's why we, we are caught in this situation of global fake news, where it's very difficult to have sources, where it's very difficult to verify the information. Um, yeah, so to, to answer your question, Maimuna, uh, generally it happens in Senegal, uh, where songs, videos are used um, for a different purpose, but it didn't happen for the coronavirus campaign. You started the presentation speaking about how many musicians, without having been asked, were composing songs, spreading them via social media, feeling that they needed to give back to all these fans, actually, through pulling attention to these issues because they actually were able or had the privilege to have seen how in international communities these messages were already still being spread uh, by, uh, to the population and so on and they weren't quite reaching some of the population in, in Senegal. There is, another, there is another question actually from my, my Mona, who says, mm -hmm. do politicians still commission musicians to get popular support? And how do you, as an artist, manage this tricky situation as well? Look, um, uh, let's say in a country like Senegal, um, despite the role of the of the, the traditional role of the artists that i've described i must say that one synchronization have done well is to was to redefine the role of the artist so uh, when colonization happened they had to find a way to get artists out of the political and social um, debate not only musicians. Let's remember that a cinematographer like Semben Usman, for example, the whole time he was releasing, producing his movies, his movies were never played in Senegal, neither on TV nor on uh, movie theaters. He had to make his own project of taking his own films to African yeah, audiences. Yeah, of course. And he was not the only one. And let's remember uh, that in the 70s, because there was only one political party, um, the rest of the, 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 the opposition was underground and illegal. And the opposition, actually, the only way they had was to write songs and theater plays. And to this day, there are lots of popular songs that are sung out there and people don't even know it's coming from the opposition from the 70s. And it called for the use of local languages by our government. It called for a revision of our education, education system and even the, govern, the, the, the governance system. You know, so really some revolutionary subjects. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm a bit lost. Yeah, I'm, no, I, I, was just, I was just not There, there are so many things in my mind right now. Of the question, this idea of being commissioned by, I mean, you get yeah. commissioned yeah. by artistic organizations. So, so what do you yeah, accept the role, the role, to manage the situation? The role, the role of the artist. So it was redefined back then. But then when, when, when the most popular music genre, which is Malach, uh, was created beginning of the 80s um, because artists were put, put aside um, of the political and social debate. Um, Balak became very popular, but uh, Balak didn't address social or political issues. Therefore, hip hop was the first genre to bring back artists talking about politics, artists, um, getting invested into social issues. Um, 
And from there, from the moment hip hop came in the, in the, uh, at the end of the 80s, um, the collaboration between artists and politicians really changed because rappers had given an example of how um, impartial artists should be, how they should be uh, at the front um, to um, to mediate between the people and the government, um, and also, but also to address social issues, um, judicial issues, and and, and 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 political issues. So, I think since the eighties, it's been really difficult to see artists collaborate with the government. That it happened, huh? it happened, but it was like really, um, it was happening once every now and then. And then those artists, because they had been collaborating with the government, um, actually their career went down. So until, until uh, let's say 2000, 2002, to make a hit song in Senegal, it had to be a political song, mm. especially when you're a rap, when you are a rapper. To make a hit song, it had to be a political song. Now, the first time we changed government in this country was in 2000. After 2000, um, there was a momentum. Everybody was hopeful that the country is going to change. And in between 2000 and 2010, it was really difficult for artists to attack the government because they would always come up with the excuse of, yeah, but this is a no government, even 10 years after. This is a no government. Uh, previously, the government which was here were here for 40 years and they destroyed a lot. So now we have to rebuild all these things. And it is only in 2011 that artists came back and opposed the government with the Yanamar movement. Um, but what's what's and extraordinary just to remind our audiences that Yanamar was the collective that was behind yeah. the production of Faraduchi coronavirus but again they had been involved for a long time in yeah Yana, Yanamar is a collective is a collective of artists and and journalists um that was created in 2011 and Yanamar basically uh, literally means we're fed up um and the context in which Yanamar was created was a context of unemployment, um, economic, a deep economic crisis in the country. Um, we could stay four or five days with only one or two hours electricity. People were dying in the hospital. Um, and Yanama was created by a group of rappers and journalists. And at the end of it, um, six months later, there were millions of Senegalese people out in the street for probably the biggest demonstrations ever in, in Senegalese history. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why Yanama is really significant in terms of social movement. Um, but what happened now, um, for the first time in the 2019 presidential elections, artists were clearly, very clearly, supporting different candidates mm. even rappers groups of rappers were for this candidate another group were for this other candidate you know and for the first time it happened in senegal the whole time artists the position of artists was look we're not going to tell you who to vote for um, you are responsible people we trust that you can make the right choice the only thing we got to watch is this What's the program of the candidate? Um, how is the, what's the solution the candidate is proposing for unemployment, for education, for agriculture, um, for, uh, for, for women's condition? You know, that, that used to be the tradition, but since 2019, it has completely changed. Mm -hmm. um, meaning uh, what Maimuna is talking about there are more and more songs commissioned by politicians or films or mm. paintings or books. There are lots of books out there written by, uh, by some serious authors, but 
mutual permission by politicians. And that's where we sort of are right now. Maimuna says, the power of music. Thank you for the education, Katie. I wanted to keep inviting the audience to think about questions, comments, and thoughts to share here with Katie. But I wonder, now that we have this context, shall we watch the video again with an extra of the songs? Let's do it. Let's go. It was really interesting before to hear you talk about the different geographies of rappers and how we could map different neighborhoods in Senegal where there are rappers and make all of this. I, I was now looking at the video again, a video that we've seen many times, as well as many other videos with the full songs and so on. And I was struck by the diversity of people participating. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about this idea of unity within the hip hop community. You are a representative of the first generation of hip hop in Senegal. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think that you are fairly young, but actually there are younger generations coming. You keep there supporting, training, collaborating. Yeah. And there's yeah. women and men involved. Um, in Journal Rabe, you first had only Kuman and yourself, and then you started inviting women to rock with you. Can you talk a little bit more about those generations and people who are involved in the community and how you support each other? You know, um, literally, when we, when we started um, our career here, uh, none of the tools artists got today were there. We didn't have YouTube, we didn't have Facebook, uh, we had to travel um, to cities, we had to go out to meet the audience. Um, uh, and I think that sort of gave us um, um, not only um, a personality, but also um really made us realize the importance of being in touch with people nowadays um artists have become successful here in senegal and really successful without ever going on stage just because from their room they can make their music um, record themselves and make a lyrics video and put it on YouTube and become successful. No one knows them. Um, so over the years, it's like now artists are on islands because everything that we needed back in the days, and there was one place, one TV, we all needed to go there and find a way to get promoted there. Those things don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Now from the warmth of your room, you can really set up an image for yourself and promote yourself. It's really, it's basically as someone calls it, the promotion, the self-promotion era. And Senegalese artists are not uh, are caught in that reality. So what we are trying to do, uh, as from the, from the older generations, um, for example, we have a program like Journal Rappé, which was really successful and went worldwide. Um, is to reach out to those artists um, as a sign of, look, um, we need to share platforms. If my platform can benefit you, then it's fine. Then you can, you can touch a bigger audience. Because um, if you really look at it, that's the only way we can survive. Um, being an African artist comes with many, 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 many layers. And one of the things that really can help us survive, not only in Senegal, but make us survive um, regarding the international scene is unity. Um, and that's really what the older generation has been trying to put into this new generation. The last video we watched with Yusundur, Yusundur is someone who had like, who had like almost 50 years of career and in the same song there are people like omg like people like samba Pizzi, who barely got four years of of a career um and to create those spaces where artists can meet it's not only art that is exchanged it's also values it's also ways of doing things uh, approaches we have 
when it comes to what we're doing. Um, that is why it is important to, to see these artists collaborate, um, not only during the pandemic, but also for, for other issues and on platforms like Journal Rapé. While there are more comments and questions from the audience, feel free to just put them in the chat any time. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the difference between the first and the second wave and what was the mm -hmm. shift as well in, in the messages that were being spread, but also in the attitude as well by musicians that had been involved in the composition of these first songs. Yeah, um, look, um, between the first and the second wave, artist position um, have shifted a bit. Uh, because um, artists also have to be aware of um, the, conse the consequences on people because um, artists are not living in the rich areas, politicians do, um, mm. they, they're in the rich neighborhoods. Artists, no matter how rich they are, they still, the majority of artists live amongst the people um, and therefore um, they can have a different reading of this whole situation they know that this is not only a health crisis it's also an economic crisis it's also a social crisis mm -hmm. and therefore um, try to mediate between the people and the government um, because yeah one thing one thing with the senegalese government um, we can criticize them for a lot of things, but they always consulting um, non-members of the government. They are consulting artists because of their position in society. They are um, they are consulting marabouts who are spiritual guides and got a lot of disciples because they can give them another context. Um, so um, yeah, between the first and the second wave yeah opinions had shifted and the message was very different the message was not anymore um stay home stay home don't go out if you don't need if you don't need to go out but the message was look um it seems like we're in this for the long run so we need to change the government need to change the strategy because people need to eat people need to work um, people need to go to school uh, they just can't ask us um, to stay home, to close down the shops. It's not viable in the long run. It's not going to work. Um, and artists themselves were impacted by the coronavirus. And artists themselves had a demonstration. Mm. Yeah, I actually, had... I actually wanted to talk to you, well, to ask you a bit about that. Because, um, I mean, you are obviously sharing so much insightful information with all of us. But it is very rare to read about how the coronavirus pandemic looks like in African countries from um, this part of the world. In, in this case, I'm talking in, in I'm talking from London, but I'm originally mm -hmm. from Spain. I've been based there. I follow as well the Spanish media. And it's been very rare for me to come across uh, media coverage in mainstream media about the situation over there, unless I was specifically looking for it. <coughs> And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about what these artists are doing right now. I'm aware that the concerts are opening up and the festivals mm. have these musicians who were so generous to give their creativity, their time and their means of production yeah. to people to receive back any kind of support, even though that wasn't their purpose. Yeah, um, for one year, literally, artists did perform. Um, in the, during that year, in the beginning, when artists were fully committed to um, raising awareness against the coronavirus, not only had artists recorded these songs, released those videos, um, communicated on social media, but lots of artists also had concerts, online concerts, because um, there was a curfew, people couldn't go out at night, artists knew that the people needed to be entertained between brackets. So there were lots of free concerts. Yusundur gave um, 
I think four or five concerts mm -hmm. from his living room with his musicians, um, artists like Purposer. Um, they had deals with uh, with TV channels where they would go and give free concerts without getting paid and, and, and stuff like that. Because everybody was convinced that, yeah, it's going to take three months, it's going to take six months. But after a year of artists not going on stage, and one of the arguments actually when artists demonstrated was, you might see me only being on stage, but there are there's a whole crew behind me. Mm -hmm. There is an electrician, there is a sound engineer, um, there is a stage manager, uh, I've got my manager, I've got my musicians, and all of those people are not working anymore since one year. And those people got families to feed. Um, at the beginning of the of the pandemic, the government had decided to support artists, but come on, the support the government we're in a poor country and we've got other priorities um and even that small amount of money that was given to artists to support them a lot of people were against it because people were like yeah um you know uh, before the pandemic artists made money so they are they're pretty comfortable with money so why would you give money to the artists again people always have in mind that when KT is going on stage, it's KT only. They don't see mm. the five, six, seven people behind me and that I'm paying or earning a living from what we're doing together. Um, so that is that is why artists were really open also to understanding the situation that people were going through. And at one point for artists to oppose the government, like, hey, this is now getting too much because we're not getting outside of the country to perform. We cannot perform in the country. Um, so we need a solution here. Um, and for all of, for, because of all of that, um, the government ended um, the ban on concerts, uh, performances, and I think now, since uh, since half a year, um, everything is open again. Um, yeah, of course, um, people try to respect the measures, um, have a, have a mask, social distance. But I guess when people are in a concert or in a nightclub, enjoying the music, enjoying um, the artist's performance, all of those things are forgotten. We're running out of time and I don't want to leave on a negative note. I actually wanted to reflect as, we, as well about the, the kind of lessons learned from the pandemic. We've been talking about how we were able to connect in an intimate way with musicians by being invited mm -hmm. to their homes. I mean, that's where we are connected right now. This is my yeah. living room and so are you. And it's kind of publicly yes. being shared with everyone yeah. here. So that's been as well a very intimate kind of a sphere created as part of that unity environment that has been over there. But something that has become very clear as well from this pandemic is the precarity in the music sector, in the cultural sector, the need to have more uh, policies, the need to have a more inclusive system. What is it that, that you think we could learn um, from the pandemic that could take us to a more inclusive and sustainable future in the work of art and music, more specifically? Um, I think one of the biggest, one of the biggest, biggest lessons artists, singers, artists have learned here, because the music industry is mainly really relying on capital coming from outside, outside the country. Um, once artists, Senegalese artists tour outside the country, they sure to make good money. Um, because we've always been in that idea that um, people are poor here, so they don't need to participate. We've produced Journal Rappé for four years for free. Mm. And we were even giving it to the TV for free. And at this point, because um, it has gotten bigger, you can't make people work for free. We can't afford to spend 
our time, days and nights, working on putting together Ushunal Rape and giving it to the TVs and or putting it on the internet for free. So I think that's with the pandemic, that is what artists learn, that they need to have um, a sustainable system that can survive um, without uh, the help of organizations, um, either from Senegal or from outside of Senegal, that we need a sustainable system where artists can commercialize their product um, and earn a living with it. But the, 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 that question um, becomes even more important when it comes to performing. Because when you record an album, there are ways of you know, selling the music, but um, how do you perform in a situation where people can't get together? Um, so now, I guess the next step that artists, are, Senegalese artists are gonna work on um, is a way to perform online Mm. Um, for people to attend um, and have the possibility of online payment or mobile money payment. Mm. So all, people are thinking of all yeah. those systems, you know, because um, this pandemic g gave us a clear idea of um, how fragile the whole system, the whole music industry here is, yeah. you know, because once again, once again, um, there is no clear structure as in the US or as in London of, of the music industry. Um, it's just, you know, you just do by your things by yourself. You try to make it by yourself. There are no institutions you can go to. There, there are no labels. Um, you got to do it by yourself. But even, even though we have to do everything by ourselves, but we can have goals, actually. We can have goals and try to work toward those goals. And one of those goals is to organize this whole thing and in a way that will help artists survive in times of crisis. I remember when, um, well, it was times of pandemic and I was feeling quite nostalgic about not being in, in Senegal because I often travel there once per year and so on to do some research projects and, and so on. It was actually really nice to see that some of these formats were being tested already. I could attend yes. talks, talks that had never yeah. been made available to me in the past while I was away. Mm -hmm. And I remember listening to one of your um, colleagues from the hip hop world, uh, someone that I really like, uh, Ina Tiam, who is also yeah. well, he's the photographer basically yeah. of everything yeah. that happens over there in, in terms of hip hop. And now she's put together an exhibit, well, various exhibitions, a book. She's also been talking about how before she didn't really look after her online presence, right? Mm -hmm. Not having mm -hmm. a website. And um, thanks to the pandemic, she realized that there was also a potential international audience to look after and to take care of. Of course. And of another course. really uh, big thing that happened during the pandemic was uh, Maitresse d'Anomarie mistress of American, mm -hmm. a Senegalese series in Marodi television by Cal Calista C that had millions of viewers. I mean, after the first episode was uploaded, there were like 4 million views um, in, in the YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Again, these things are already happening. So maybe it's, it's a way. Yeah, of, so. yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, of course, now, now artists are realizing um, everything that can be done with the internet, um, but um, it doesn't suffice to only know what you can do with the internet. It requires organization, it requires funds, um, and they are very aware of it. Um, I was talking about um, the appearance of, of uh, community managers. Now it, it's a, it's a it's a real job out there. Mm. Um, there are lots of people um, who are trained uh, to be social social media managers. Um, and when they finish their training, um, you can't hire them for free. They cannot come and work for artists for free. So 
um, I think the point we we are right now is to realize that um, we need to change our model a bit, but there is no people who will come and have a position in the in the in the line of work. Those people need to get paid too, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and those platforms um, we've got, for example, when it comes to streaming services, we've got uh, Nix, who's a rapper um, who created an online streaming service for African music um, called Dido. And a lot of Senegalese artists now, when they're releasing their album, in instead of trying to put it on Spotify first and Apple Music first, you know, um, they work with Dido because they can always go directly in their offices, talk, negotiate with them, um, have a good contract. Um, and Dido sort of distributes, not only do they put it on their own platform, but from their platform, it goes to Spotify, it goes to Apple Music, it goes to Deezer, AudioMark, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there is also another rapper who's got a um, streaming platform, a very big one, Zixen. And mm -hmm. it's not only for, for music, it's also for cinema, you know. And he's been actually quite uh, helping. He's been helping, supporting, uh, I'm going to say supporting a lot of artists and giving them good contracts, not only to exploit the, the, the product, but also participate in the production of their product. Uh, giving money in advance so artists can be comfortable to work. So, and I think solutions like that will be the future for mm -hmm. Senegalese, not only Senegalese music, but Senegalese culture. Mm -hmm. um, we are realizing that we are not a priority for Apple. We are not a priority for Netflix. We are not a priority for Spotify. And countries like Nigeria, are also setting a good example for African countries. And now more and more, a lot of people are investing in the cultural area in Senegal, which 10 years ago didn't really exist, but now people are investing in serious investment because we are getting invaded by all of these French companies mm -hmm. um, from Bolloré, uh, Pate, they are here. Universal are coming, Sony are here, they're signing artists, giving them shitty contracts. So now um, there is a sort of race to set up local structures so that artists can really um, get the fruits of, uh, of, their, of their labor. And I like your focus on solutions. One of their favorite, one of my favorite people who I have worked with in in Senegal, President Baba Karsar of FESPOP, the Festival of Folklore yeah. Percussion in Luga, where I have spent um, some time already, always says that there are never problems, there's always solutions. And I always think this is something to, yeah. to learn here. Thank you for this great conversation, Katie and Estrella, my Muna Fest. I hope the world remembers how it's music, films, books, and arts in general that keep us sane as well during the lockdown supporting yeah. artists for sure thank you so much Katie, for being thank with you, us Australia. it's been a great pleasure as always uh, to talk to you and i just wanted to say um, bye to the people by reminding of what we were talking today about senegalese music to raise coronavirus awareness some of the findings that we will be sharing in a journal article for the journal of african media studies but before we go, uh, before you go, we also wanted to please let you know of the other kinds of events that are happening. We are also running a short survey that is anonymous. So please make sure that you get the time and just scan the QR code to get access to that. It's really important for us to have your feedback for the rest that, of events that are happening. This was an event as part of the Black History Month program at the University of Southampton. I'm so grateful that our event was um, selected to be part of this. And there's also more things coming up in the next few days. You can join us, for example, next Friday for the film screening and Q&A of Tales of the Accidental City. 
with the director and performer Maimuna Jalo. And just I don't want to give any spoilers, but this was meant to be a theater play and became a film and it's actually an award winning film that is performed via Zoom. So please join us for both the screening and the discussion. Tonight's event is also part of the preliminary program of the Southampton Arts and Humanities Festival that is going to be starting on the 11th of November and run until the 20th of November. Everything is free and you're able to access online, but also some of the things are going to be on site. So please have a look at the program and um, keep in touch with us so that you can join us. The festival will conclude as well with the Hands-On Humanity Day, which will be back in person in our Avenue campus on the University of Southampton. And this is going to be on Saturday the 20th. And tickets are available for booking already in our festival website. So please have a look at that. Thank you so much to Katie again, to all of you for your wonderful you. comments. And yeah, we will be in touch. Bye. Bye.